Hello, everybody. It's 1.30 on Thursday, and I'd like to welcome you to our first installment of our webinar series, Leading Through Crisis, hosted by the Guelph Chamber of Commerce and the Lang School. My name is Shikiba Shayani, and I'm the president and CEO of the Guelph Chamber of Commerce. For those of you who don't know, the Guelph Chamber is a non-for-profit, member-driven organization where we advocate, connect, and convene on behalf of members to foster economic prosperity for our community. Today, we hear from experts who will provide insights into the short and long-term resilience strategies for your business. Before we get started, I wanna go over a few housekeeping items. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout the webinar. We will be taking questions after each panelist and we'll have time at the end of the webinar for questions and answers from the audience. We have enabled an upvoting uh, feature on questions. So if you see a question you would like answered, simply upvote it and we will try our best to answer the most popular questions. There will be a few polls active throughout the webinar and our panelists will be using the raise hand feature as well. We would appreciate your participation to help inform our panelists of who is in the audience. And so to begin, and as you've probably noticed, our first poll question that we'd like you to complete is up so that we can have a better understanding of who is all participating. So I'd like to uh, uh, move forward and let you know that who's joining us today. We have a leading scholar in entrepreneurship and innovation strategy and one of Canada's most successful entrepreneurs and philanthropists. And I'm so happy to be joining them. Jim Estel, as you all know, is a serial innovator and a technology entrepreneur. He is the CEO of Danby and founder and CEO of Shipperby, a cost-effective carbon emission reducing disruptor in parcel delivery sector and doing a fantastic job in providing their services during this pandemic. Jim's praised for his philanthropic ventures, which include sponsoring, educating, and hiring Syrian refugees to help equip them with the tools to succeed for a new life in Canada. Alongside Jim, we have Felix Arndt with us. Professor Felix Arndt is the John F. Wood Chair in Entrepreneurship at the Gordon S. Lang School of Business and Economics at the University of Guelph. His research intersects strategy, entrepreneurship, and innovation, and explores how firms use organizational renewal and technological innovation to stay ahead of the competition. His research has been published in leading journals throughout the world and has been featured in national media. We're very glad to have him here in Guelph. Quickly, I'm gonna take a look at the poll results before passing the mic over to uh, Professor Felix. And as we can see, and you can all see, it looks like we have quite a few small business folks joining us, 33%, quite a few medium and large sized businesses as well. And you can see the other responses along the bottom. Thank you for participating. And off to you, Felix. Thank you very much, Shakiba. So I was asked to give a five to 10 minutes a short speech on uh, my reflections on um, the topics, opportunities and strategic resilience. I did prepare a small slide, just one, um, that I wanted to share. Let me try whether this works. Yeah, here we go. I think that should uh, be all right. So let me reflect a little bit on, on uh, what has happened. Maybe we can start with a short poll and you can tell us whether your company had some kind of plan in place for any crisis to happen in, in 2020. Can you raise your hand so that we can see? A few hands go up, if I see that correctly. I guess what we learned from the last crisis, the financial crisis, um, is that we do need to be prepared for a crisis to come. And I think 2020 was to a certain extent doomed for that. And also what we learned is that innovation shapes the society after this crisis. So many of the things we are experiencing now will accelerate innovations, will change how consumers um, behave, and that will change the new normal, if we want to call it like this. This crisis is so quite different from um, the financial crisis. And it's different because the financial crisis impacted everyone. This one impacts everyone as well, but not in the same way. So we have kind of three different groups. 
we have one group that of companies that has a search and demand. If you think about Zoom that we're currently using, um, stock price really rocketed. Netflix, um, Amazon, kind of delivery services, um, Slack, and so on. These are kind. Of, these these are companies that really are hiring at the moment. So if you're looking for a job, this is a place to look at. Um, there are some businesses that are hampered, um, where there's less demand or not enough supply to fulfill this demand. Um, and then there are some businesses that are completely closed down. I'm thinking of hotels uh, and many other companies, for example, in the tourism industry. So this crisis is very different because um, different sectors are comp are affected in very, very different way. I think the one thing that most companies, as those that are in a lucky position, um, that there's actually a surge in demand, that they're growing, um, everyone struggles with cash management. Um, but we could see in the last 10 years that large companies have assembled a lot of cash. So they are less likely to have this issue in terms of uh, cash management um, that is pressing. However, we have also seen large companies like Air Canada that immediately laid off 16,500 workers um, as a reaction of the shutdown and the drop in demand. We have startups that are uh, probably in very different situations that are losing valuations. Um, and when they think about raising funding are in a difficult position because the valuations are much um, lower than they were before. Um, and we can also probably see that these large businesses um, that have a lot of cash or some of them um, will look into buying some of the smaller companies um, and some of the startups once this crisis is a little bit more predictably over. And then most of us are probably in about SMEs, the same boat, we have a big problems. We don't have a lot of cash to run for a long time. Um, I think there have been surveys which show that two thirds of, of the small businesses have a maximum of three months of cash, most of them much shorter. So it's very difficult um, for them. And the result of this is that we're looking into finding solutions for this and cutting costs for everything that is not essential to businesses or um, finding new ways of creating cash flows. I think a second issue that we're seeing in the short run is if you have to lay off people and we see in the US, there are 22 million I think now um, laid off in the last months. In Canada, it, uh, it's also a very big number. Um, there's still a competitive labor market. So those companies that are actually in growth, they're looking for talent and now they have a good opportunity if you have to lay off talent um, to get this, talent, yeah, to, to, to hire this um, talent. We're looking at market changes that are quite unusual, also very different from the financial crisis because we don't have a demand shock. So we're, we're not, not consuming anymore. In fact, we are very willing to consume. I think most of us would be very willing to go to a restaurant um, in some way if there was a possibility of doing this in a safe way, but we're experiencing a supply shock. So that means that um, there's um, not the possibility of supplying certain goods that we would be willing to consume. And there's a consumer poll, um, as we call it, saying that consumers want to consume something, but there's not enough offers. For example, we're probably, most of us um, are, do now have a Netflix account that we didn't have before, um, or maybe we had it before, but now we're using it more extensively um, because we cannot watch ice hockey because there's no ice hockey game being performed. So this is um, some of the things that I wanted to talk about. And then coming to the slide, um, I try to um, give you a little model in terms of short-term responses, uh, mid-run responses and long-term responses. So in the short run, obviously, we are looking into repairing um, what's needed. That is often cost cutting to everything that's not essential. Um, if you can, you should probably keep innovation innovation expenses up because we do see and we have learned from um, former crisis that those companies that are able to keep up with um, innovation um, R&D expenses, they are in the long run coming out very positively. We are looking at companies, um, many of the brick and mortar stores are going online. 
the first time they have an online store and now they're experiencing new consumers and going through a very steep learning curve. And we're looking into, and this is a transition to the mid-run responses, um, into new solutions where, for example, Dylan's Gin, um, one of our distilleries here in Guelph, um, now produces sanitizers. We see the University of Guelph, the makerspace, has started um, to 3D print PPE equipment. Milita is the same. Ford has joined efforts to um, produce medical equipment. So there's a lot of citizenship that we are seeing, which is really is a, is a, is a great um, thing to do. And I think in terms of these midterm responses, um, the question is, so how can you produce, how can you come up with new opportunities to, um, to bring new products to market, to find new customers. And I think there the core is assessing your core capabilities. So what are you really good at? Or what can you do? What does your technology allow you to do? And that is something that um, requires some reflection and that is worthwhile thinking about. So I think that the gin distillery, for example, was not clear that they would ever produce sanitizers when they were founded, but they're doing it now possibly due to citizenship behavior, possibly because it's a way to generate um, income. So these are kind of fast responses. We can also see this, um, that the fast responses deferred. If you, for example, go back to the example um, of Air Canada, we saw that they laid off right away 16,500 people. And the moment the wage subsidies were announced by the government, they rehired all these people immediately. If you look at the competitor Lufthansa, they're quite different in what they do. They started communicating that the moment the crisis hit, they stopped flying with their A380s. So they completely grounded their A380s fleet. Um, and as a midterm response, just a few weeks later, they discontinued one of the airlines, German Wings, and they discontinued many of their long haul airplanes. So these, and now they can't sell them at the moment, but they have already made long-term plans of how demand will shift in the future. So they're expecting to see much less flights in um, the future, particularly long-haul flights. And I think this comes then in terms of um, what can we do in the long run? And there are many different opportunities that come up. I think if you are clear about what are your core capabilities, what can you do? And then it is in the long run, the question, so how can you build in the new normal competitive advantage? And then the question is, so how do you renew your business model? I brought the example of the Dylan's gin. Will they continue to do sanitizers? How can they improve this? Um, the brick and mortar st stores that went online, the question here is, I guess, how can they participate in the digitalization, uh, digitalization 2.0? So not only the question, can you run an online shop but how can online um, add value to your competitive advantage, add value to your um, products and services that you offer? I think in the long run, we have to rethink, so what are the ecosystems that we are in? What are partners? What are complementary products that can um, help us serving this new normal? And of course, what we will also see in the long run is that the mega trends, for example, um, digitalization, but also AI um, automation will be accelerated. So now we are all online and most likely we will we'll stay online, maybe not to the same extent as we're in now, but we will in the long run be much more online. So business travel is likely to go back for, uh, down, for example, I would think. Um, there's also the, if we look at the agri-food sector, for example, um, we are now figuring out that our food chains are not as robust as we thought. So automation might be an answer to um, many of the problems we are currently facing. And money at the moment is free, given that the interest rate is almost zero. Another thing that you could think about is governments will spend more in the next years. And the question is, where will they spend it? Will they try to build a new normal? Or what are industries, what are um, philosophies that they will try to push in their investments? And that is a place where it could be worthwhile being. I think for the moment, I hope I haven't uh, extended the time that I was allocated. Is that enough?
That's great. That's uh, great feedback and an excellent slide. Thank you, Felix. Um, and to give uh, credit similarly to um, Dixon's distillery here, right in Guelph, who's done um, and adapted their uh, resources to do the same thing. Actually, most and many of our distilleries and, and many companies here in Guelph are adapting uh, their products and services to, to meet the immediate need. Um, but then per to your point, we'll need to think about how to be able to readapt and continue to adapt and evolve through the short and long term as well. I have two quick questions for you before we pass it over to Jim. Um, first of all, um, uh, you know, we often hear um, a lot of description and we just pulled for size of sector and business. Um, small business, what does that really mean? Um, you know, I think uh, legally or um, in the government terms, small business includes anyone from you know, zero to um, 100, sometimes 500 employees. Do you define that a specific way? Um, small businesses, that really depends on the definition you use. The OECD, for example, I think uses one to 10 people. Um, so some talk about micro businesses for those that are either um, where only the owner works on family. Um, so this definition is uh, quite arbitrary and I'm, I'm not sure um, that matters much. I think the situation they're in matters more here than rather than the size. That's a good point. And finally, um, very interestingly, we have someone uh, participating on the call from Duke University and is commenting on how hard the US is being hit as well. Do you have any comments about that? Um, are you able to expand on um, cross-border uh, impacts? Well, I guess this, well, this is a very, we could probably talk about this question for quite a while. I guess this, this hints towards the question, um, where are we going to, to be afterwards? Will, we be, will countries become more independent again? I guess what we will see, for example, in the food sector is that countries probably want to be more independent and not um, depend so much on international supply chains. And I guess this is what, so what we normally have is, um, if you think about the advantages of large firms is that they're diversified and this international diversification um, helps them to when one country is hit by a crisis to still sell their products somewhere else um, this is now not possible because most of the countries are locked down even those that um, open up early um, they still face a problem that we also in supply side um, have this lockdown so most of them have bottlenecks in international supply chains that they can't supply their goods. So they can't actually sell, even though if the country is open, they can't sell because they can't produce. Um, and that is a very unusual um, situation that probably most companies were not prepared for in this, uh, and which has been, or, or the problem is of course facilitated by the degree of globalization that we have in some supply chains more than others. Um, and I guess in terms of contingency planning of um, what kind of prices will hit in the future, companies will have to rethink um, how these bottlenecks can be avoided. That's excellent feedback and perhaps we can dive deeper um, after uh, Jim contributes as well. Jim, over to you. I guess it helps if I unmute. Yeah. <laughs> So in, in thinking about the seminar, what, what is it that people want to know? Well, of course, everyone wants to know when's it going to end. And the answer is, we don't know. We have to assume that it will take a long time. And so what we spend time on is scenario planning. What if sales are down 20%? What if sales are down 30%? What if sales are down 40%? And what does that mean for different uh, areas? As a leader, I do know we need to change the way we communicate. Because in, in my case, I was actually quite a... a management by wandering around guy and I would walk through my office and I would casually talk to people and and whatnot and it's actually a little weird when I call someone who's in payables to say uh oh the CEO is calling well it was never a problem when I walked past their desk and said something so we have to change the way we communicate one thing I started doing is I do a daily I call it a wartime CEO update and I update what things I see in the news where I think we're going and whatnot to keep everyone sort of on the same um, song sheet at the same time I'm realistic so I say this is sincerely what I believe I don't say oh the world's uh, great you know the sun's shining and everything's good um, I think in terms of uh, economies at different times so currently we are in a pandemic economy what will it be post pandemic 
So in a pandemic economy we're in right now, no one buys, very few people buy my products. You, we, we sell wine coolers, they're optional. Uh, we have a 30% market share in hotel fridges. No one needs a Danby hotel fridge when you know all the hotels are closed. Um, Post pandemic though, I, actually what we're sold out on is freezers. Of course, everyone's going and buying freezers. Um, we sell a, a portable uh, laundry machine that we don't even make. We just put our label on it. And again, that's selling like hotcakes. People don't want to go down to the laundromat or down to the laundry in their building. Um, Post pandemic, people will be more focused around being at home. So it will be home office, they're gonna need bar fridges. It's going to be entertaining at home. We need more fridge space. We're going to be uh, more wine coolers because we're not gonna go on Jamaica vacations as much. We've got money, we're entertaining at home. The other thing that switched uh, as an employer is the, uh, the dynamic between employee, employer. It, we were in an environment where you couldn't hire people for many, many jobs, especially blue collar jobs. If you wanted to hire truck drivers, it was very, very difficult. Um, that will flip almost completely. There will be very high unemployment and it will be easy to hire people. So the dynamic uh, flips a lot. In a weird way, uh, I'll actually make a comment though on helping create the world that you want. And that is whenever you spend money, you are voting with your dollars. So if you like, I just bought uh, something at the Running Works, which is a store downtown Guelph. It's a small store, it's not a chain. They put up an online store, they're not Amazon. Why did I buy it for them? Because post pandemic and going forward, I want them to be open. Because I like going into Running Works and having them tell me that this shoe fits properly or not and it's better for my gait and blah, blah, blah. And so when you're spending money, vote with your dollars. You vote with your dollars, you're telling brands, you like the brand, you like what they're doing, you tell the company. And so definitely you can still support local businesses. To some extent, this pandemic is an entrepreneur's dream, which I am an entrepreneur. And the problem with that is uh, I have no focus. So I come in in the morning and I say, oh, well, let, let's go this direction. So I, I'm, I'm always, everyone's chasing squirrels. because I'm saying we wanna go in 18 different directions. In a peacetime, that's not as healthy as it could be. So I have to restrain myself. Now in wartime, the whole company needs to try more ideas. So um, what Danby did is we actually did a, a pivot. We're making ventilators. The, why would we do that? We're not a medical uh, equipment manufacturer, whatnot. Why is that good? We're saving the world. Everyone gets on board for saving the world, saving lives. And at the same time, we're saving jobs. So I want to keep my good people and they have a job, they can keep working. Um, had I pivoted us into making ventilators or any kind of medical equipment a year ago, they would have said I was crazy. And they say I'm crazy enough when I go into some of the little side ventures I do, even, even like Shipper B. Now Shipper B benefits, post pandemic, everyone's going to buy e-commerce. In the, this pandemic, you would say they also benefit, but they don't because many of the drivers Quit. They didn't want the danger. They didn't think there was a danger in driving for. And many, um, it's hard to sign a new account because people don't want to sign a new account now. So basically, we're just sort of, sort of in a hold pattern on Shipper B. And anyway, why don't uh, we open it up for questions and uh, go from there? Sure. Thanks for um, for that, Jim, and that insight. And actually, a couple of the quick questions that have already come in for you, you've already touched on. Um, you know, you're talking about restraint as a leader. As someone has asked, what has been the hardest part of your role to lead um, during uh, the crisis? And um, the, the follow-up or connected question was related around the coordination of the industry to manufacture ventilators. And what has your role been like um, as you've tried to lead that? Uh, industry uh, adapt as well. So, so we start first on just leading and leadership. It, we had to change completely. Everybody who has, works in the office is working at home. Of course, if you're in a warehouse, you're not working at home. You can't drive a forklift at home. Uh, we, you, even, but even in the warehouse and manufacturing, everything is spread out and, and different rules and, and it's just a different life. Before this, I'm old school. I want everybody in the office because that, might, that way I can talk to them. And now I'm gonna say, well, maybe we can have competitive advantage with people working at home because some people actually do work better at home. And so there will be a, a change in that. But as a leader, we need to communicate, we need to over communicate, we need to have empathy because this, these are not usual times. People are afraid. 
Now, the other thing I will say though, is we're reacting to the reaction to COVID so far. That's easier than when we react to COVID. I do not know anybody who has COVID. I have a friend of a friend who has COVID. That's the closest. And nobody I know or even friends of friends have died. It will touch our company. It may be one of our employees. It may be one of their mothers, one of their uh, aunts or uncles. When COVID touches, it will even change the dynamic uh, more. But as a leader, uh, the other thing that's happened in our company is leaders have way more work because it's not as easy to do the job the old way. And so, and of course, partly when I take on the ventilator project, I, I got way more work to, to do. But then there's other people who now work at home. They have a little less work depending on what it is that they do. So you have to redistribute, which is what a business do, does. They distribute the work and say, okay, this accounting person does this, and this production person does this, and this operations person does this, and spread it all out. Now those, those roles all change. Um, as far as coordinating um, the ventilators, we, when, when, when we want to produce a ventilator, which we, well, this was only eight weeks ago, we said to the, I said to the whole design and engineering department, all we're gonna do is design ventilators. So we switched the whole engineering team to designing ventilators. Fast design, you know, uh, sprints and daily meetings and do the whole thing. Well, we figured out we can't design a ventilator. And I was over ambitious, which entrepreneurs tend to be. So it's sort of like me saying to the team, we want to design and make a car. And by the way, we've got two weeks to do it. So we reached out to other companies like uh, ABS Friction, Rick Jamison was, and Rick Jamison has driven most of this. He's, he's been an awesome high energy negotiator. He's, he's tracked everything down. Um, Scott Scheuer from uh, JMP Engineering. Um, Paul LaRue from uh, Crystal Fountains has done fast prototyping. So these are other companies. And in the end, when we started to produce a medical device, we didn't have medical licensing because we don't make medical. So we work, we pair partner with Bayless Medical. So it's a matter of pulling together a team and not saying, oh, we're only going to do it ourselves. Um, the other thing I'll say is because this is a crisis, we do get buy-in. So I, will, I can reach out to almost anybody, even if it's not their line of work. And there are a few teams of companies and people that are doing it. So, um, and we talk to each other. So they're missing, um, uh, Honeywell part, and we're missing a, um, a valve, and where do you know where to find these? And we, it's I'm not going to say it's a competition; it's more cooperation because we're trying to save the world here. And I don't want to say, oh well, we we need, we need to get as many of these solutions over the finish line as we can. And the government has even recognized that. So the government's given I think four different orders to four different companies, um, and they are they are just saying, well, who who can produce, who can't produce. It has to be a belt and suspenders. What's going to be your backup and whatnot? That makes sense. It looks like you were going to say something. No, I'm, uh, I'm, all, I'm just reading uh, questions. Oh, perfect. Well, I have a couple more specifically for you, and then we'll just open up generally also after that, uh, the general Q&A. And I'll remind everyone who's uh, listening to not forget to upvote the questions that they see that they like, that they'd like to be posed. Um, but another question that came in, Jim, was uh, for an online business considering expanding into different online platforms, like through Amazon or using Shopify, would it be best to hold off expansion until everything blows over or no? Do you have any feedback? I don't think you should hold off at all because now is a time your staff will, will buy in completely and your customers will buy in. Like I, I, I'm the, the running work example is a perfect example. They didn't, I don't even think they had a website or if they did, they did, I'm sure they had a website, but I don't think they had a buy online and whatnot for them to add a shopping cart and whatnot. They get my business because I want to support them. If you wait until this is done, people are starting to buy your products elsewhere and your staff themselves will, will give you major buy-in. So I would strongly encourage to do it now. And that's sort of why I said, if this is an entrepreneur's dream, you can do it now and you can get buy-in now where otherwise you have to plan for a year. I get it up and running, even if it means order now means some, type your order in and someone uh, manually takes the visa card and manually puts it in a box and ships it because it keeps your relationship and people who are buying from you We'll have huge, we'll give you huge allowances. If Running Works says to me, uh, it, it, they send a real email, so we can't have it for two weeks, I'd have fine, you know, it's a pair of shoes. I mean, like I actually have another pair of shoes. It's not like I'm going barefoot and, uh, and whatnot. 
That's an excellent point. I'm curious um, to both of you uh, whether or not um, you think that spending will change though. I mean, there's, um, it's one thing to expand, but can we expect to see people still purchasing? Go ahead, Felix. Yeah, um, I think just to the, to the, to the prior question um, as well, and it, I think uh, connects these two questions quite well, it depends a little bit probably on your cash situation. If you have a bit of money in the background and you can grow, if you grow, if, if, if it costs you to grow, um, it does make sense. Um, you, you have to, I think what we, what we need to consider is how long this crisis is going to take. I think we are hoping it's over in a month or two. Realistically, as far as I can see it, um, before there's a vaccine, it's 12 to 18 months. So this, high, this crisis is likely to hit a second time, even if we open up the market in summer again. Um, and then it's, I think it's a question of cash management. Can you afford doing that? Um, and of course, if the economy is hit, I think um, uh, Canada statistics just brought out the GDP decline of 9% yesterday or today, this morning. So if that is something that will continue and we will have a second phase next winter that um, has a similar shutdown, um, I think it's a consideration um, where the question is, what can people um, afford? And so we already see that spending is going down. So if you look at the US, Costco has um, stopped selling what they call non-essential items. Um, so you do see that, and I think Jim also elaborated on this, that there is uh, a reduced spending that comes together because people, because times are uncertain. And particularly if you think about that a vaccine takes such a long time, and we are likely to be hit a second time in next, next winter, um, people will be more careful, I'm sure, once they realize that this is the case for sure. And I think for sure spending is gonna be way down because of the uncertainty, people and because people feel poor unemployment will be high of course if you're unemployed you're not going to spend and the stock market corrected so people who lose money in the stock market don't spend money and it ripples through the economy because it is an economy if i buy a pair of shoes at a, a store then they can afford to buy something else from somebody else and it, and it just ripples so i believe people will not spend but they will spend on different things if i'm working in a home office oh i want to improve my home so there will be some spending it just won't be spent on the same thing i i don't think that um travel vacations will come back for any time long long time i think i don't even think restaurants will come back as much because it's more inclined i'd be more inclined to have someone come over for dinner and keep it to a smaller place than to go to a bigger place so i think that that uh some things anything around uh, health though and pandemic i mean um as felix was pointing out i mean purell sales and uh and whatnot that's through the roof and mask sales are through the roof and uh, anything around safety our freezer sales were sold out i mean everybody is thinking that uh, you know toilet paper we've all read about that right everyone's sold out of that that's great thanks now a question directed to felix can you elaborate on your comments about air canada rehiring about um governments when government subsidies were introduced as opposed to lufthansa's reaction yeah, I think that there are two things. These are, of course, two different markets. So Lufthansa doesn't have the opportunity of, of just um, laying off people. But you also see that the degree of strategic response is a different one. So Air Canada had to lay off people to cut costs, and that's what they did. Um, and the moment the wage subsidy came in, be it citizenship behavior, they rehired um, their staff. From a more strategic perspective, that is problematic because Jim pointed it out. Um, I also think it will be the case. Demand will go down, particularly in the tourism sector, particularly for airlines in the long run. We are looking here not at a few months, we are looking at um, at least two, three years um, to reach the current levels or the prior le the levels of uh, passengers that we have seen before this crisis. So some airlines, and this is what I try to um, point out here, a strategic response would be directly to rethink what will be the demand situation in the near future, but also in the long run. And the answer of rehiring um, the full staff of Air Canada seems to be a little bit non-strategic at the first space. So I would, if they were in, to invite me, I would ask them this question, um, what, what the rationale behind this is. Whereas Lufthansa, 
has closed down one of their airlines, has not laid off anyone yet, but it is clear that they will reduce their fleet and by this also their staff in the long run because they have to, because there is not such a big demand anymore in the market. And this is a strategic decision that is a long run decision rather than a short term reaction to a crisis that um, considers that we will have a new normal. We will not go back to the old normal. It's a good reminder, Felix, that we have to take a minute and think strategically about what the core operations and needs of the organization and our customer or client base are and, and plan accordingly. So we've opened up our um, questions. Uh, so feel free to jump in and have a conversation as needed. Uh, we've also opened up a final poll. So um, uh, if folks do need to uh, um, walk away from this session, if you don't mind completing that poll for our uh, use for upcoming webinars, I would appreciate it. But a question that's come up on many occasions is, as a leader, how do you ensure that you're making those human connections with your team? How do you ensure that your team uh, feel certain during uncertain times? That's a really tough question. I wish I did a great job at it, but I don't think I do because you don't have enough time to do all of it. It's the, it goes back to communication. We've also become video based. So I, I do not call people on the phone. I video them. And so to videoing them and then I also work through people. So I can't possibly be connected with all of my people. I coach the managers. If you have people working for you, you need to talk to them a couple of times a day. And that means video a couple of times a day. Um, we feed them uh, what are some things they can talk about. As far as providing certainty in a time of uncertain, uh, uncertainty, I don't generally do that. I, I basically try to call it like I do, like, uh, like it is. I don't tell people, oh, wine cooler sales are going to you know, come back in a month. I don't say that. I, I even tell them, I don't think wine cooler sales are going back for a year. Like th this is uh, going to be a long-term recession. I do say we survived 2008. This company survived 9-11. This company has been around for uh, since 1947. It's going to be around till uh, 2047 or whatever. So I, I do that, but I don't try to sugarcoat the way it is. Um, and I think in a weird way, that's inspirational for people because people want to follow leaders that are realistic and you don't, you don't want to hear a fake. Like you don't want me to say uh, unequivocally, oh, this is, over, this is over on the weekend. On the weekend, just go out and party, right? Everyone go meet me in the bar on Friday. That's not, like, you don't want to hear that. That's the wrong thing. You want to hear, I think that this is serious and this is long-term. And even if we were to reopen on Friday, I think the economic repercussions of this are two years. It is long, long, long term. And some behaviors are changed permanently for some people. And I just think that's the way it is. But then, the, but as an entrepreneur, there's always little glimmers. For instance, uh, we're going hard at the RV market. Why would that be? Well, because you're gonna buy an RV and you're gonna feel safer in the RV than going to a hotel, motel. I think the, the RVs are gonna come back, which is, that's very optional, that's very luxury. but it will be a market we believe, and uh, and again, I always believe fail off and fail fast, fail cheap. So you could you you know, two years, three years from now, you can say, see, it wasn't Jim so stupid? RV business all went out of business. But uh, on the other hand, it's it's a try it and see what works, and then put more resource into what works. Yeah, it sounds like some honesty, transparency is key, but holding a sense of confidence as well is important. Felix, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I think it's a great opportunity to say in two weeks, we think we have two experts talking on exactly this topic on leadership in, in these times. I could just um, maybe add a few comments from my personal experiences as well in this crisis. I think there are many people go through emotional distress and it's time and it's important to reserve time to actually deal with that to a certain extent. I think coaching, for example, could help if you don't have a coach um, try, try it out, try whatever um, might um, help. Very important just to reiterate, um, doing the right thing is very important and be transparent about it. There's no point in, in hiding anything. Um, being transparent and communicate quickly and possibly more often than you would normally do takes anxiety away because people feel informed and um, being transparent is an important uh, part. Jim mentioned show empathy. It's important to decide quickly in these situations. I mean, we have seen that the government has changed its approach 
to help really uh, by the day, if not by the hour. And that means deciding quickly and reacting to this transparently um, is very important. So you shouldn't be shy to change your decisions as well. And reaching out to, to people that you work with um, that could, for example, also be sending them something physical. So people who are not used to digital work, um, sometimes I guess getting a package of appreciation or something like this makes them feel that there's still something left of uh, something to grab, something to touch in, in, in the company that they have been working for. Yeah, keeping things tangible, thanks. Um, what advice could either of you give to young people right now? For instance, 2020 University of Guelph grads themselves. Any feedback or advice about how to navigate um, the, the coming months and, and how to be resilient? So my experience from being old is these are always the worst of times. So that's always what people say. But in the end, you will look back and say, weren't those good times? Does it mean you have to work a little bit harder for maybe a little less money, maybe not in exactly the field you wanted to work in, maybe whatever, but treat life as a constant learning, be open. And there is a lot of opportunities. There's a lot, a lot of opportunities because when things change, that's when opportunity happens. When things are status quo, that's when opportunities don't happen. But I would not, uh, the other thing we have in Canada is really awesome social support systems. You, you are never gonna have to live under a bridge. If you see someone who is living under a bridge, they have other problems. It's not, it's not purely uh, financial, it's mental health or drugs. Yeah, I also would agree to this. Um, I think it's a great time for opportunities, particularly as a graduate, there's nothing that you feel you, you need to lose, but it's a start. So there are lots of opportunities. We talked about opportunities in health, um, there are opportunities in home entertainment that we will see. The entertainment landscape will change quite a bit. And why not jump into one of those um, companies that are growing and that are predicted to grow? So that are more digitalized, that are working with AI, with machine learning, with agri-food. And there's a long list uh, of companies that are um, up and running and that are growing even in this, during this time. This is a difference to um, prior uh, crisis. And possibly also to rethink, if you are thinking about having a very traditional career, maybe this is a moment before you actually go out to the job market, um, whether you, whether this is the right thing to do, will you be still um, part of an, I don't know, Exxon Mobile? Will you be still, you know, is a petroleum company the right place to be? Is the bank the right place to be? Will we need banks where, if you look at FinTech, they can probably um, cover most of the needs that we have in terms of banking. Do we need traditional banks? This is a long-term question. This is a question that higher education, for example, also faces. Now we are online, if we haven't been before, and um, we are even thinking about extending our online delivering to the end of the year. And if that is the case, so um, what will happen to, to this economy? And there is this notion at the moment being discussed of the superstar economy. So we're, we're talking about the Amazons as Facebooks, all these companies that have networks effect um, with, and, and have, um, have a balance sheet that is as big as some of the smaller uh, countries. So is this something that will be governed? Will education, at least when we think about lectures, we can, you know, it doesn't make a difference for us to talk to 50 or for to a thousand people if we don't have an act, interactive session. Of course, nowadays, I think universities, the value proposition is this interactiveness. Um, but in, print, in terms of delivery of information, this is scalable. And, and I think these are things um, that if I were to start in the job market now, I would think through very um, carefully um, where I want to be positioned um, in the long run for the next 30, 40 years, which is a lot of time um, for markets to change. That's great. That's excellent feedback. Thank you. So we have a few uh, additional questions that have been upvoted um, from many uh, on the webinar today. Uh, lots of questions, again, around staffing. Uh, so I'll, I'll target this to you, Jim, specifically about whether or not you've had a hard time maintaining staff levels, um, i.e. staff not feeling comfortable coming to work. And if so, how, how have you managed those levels throughout the crisis? 
Well, see, fortunately, we're not uh, serving the public, so it's not like we're running grocery stores or anything like that. We do have outlet stores, but ours would be, I would say, almost the opposite problem. Sales are down, therefore we need less people. It's not that we have problems. Shipper B, yes, we had drivers who didn't want to drive, but there's a lineup of people that want to and are willing to do that. But at the same time, as a business, you take all reasonable measures. So we have, uh, you know, Purell all over the place and sanitizers and move the workstations further apart and have a two foot standard. And uh, don't, you don't have a different person driving the forklift without it being sanitized before someone sits down in it. Like, so, so you have build those standards so people feel safer, but we're in a fortunate situation that we're not in a very unsafe environment. Um, the, everybody is naturally separated a long distance. And because we actually have less people, uh, because we actually did lay off people, um, the density is a lot less. So we're, we're not having to say crowd in at the lunchroom. And, and we do things like staggered lunches and stuff like that to spread people out further. That makes sense. Um, just to get through a few more questions, um, I'll target this one to Felix first and then get Jim's opinion. Can you comment on the political leadership um, or the media and the conversations around expediting opening up the economy despite the current pandemic unknowns? Any feedback about that, uh, that uh, tone? Well, I guess there is a natural tendency to open up the economy as soon as possible in the desire to decrease the impact on the economy. And I, I think this is a ethical question to a certain extent, how many um, deaths are we willing to accept for, um, for, for economical gains for the less economical uh, losses. Um, I think this has, you know, this is why we, we uh, elect political leaders. It's uh, up to them. To, they have the expert advice. I think they are very, fairly precise models of um, what different actions by now will actually mean in terms of um, the increase of infection numbers on a larger scale. So I think they make very informed decisions um, and, and they have the, the intellectual power of um, the right people behind them, of having models that they know what's most likely gonna happen. And um, we can only hope they make the right decisions there. Yeah, evidence-based is what we want. So if that makes sense. Uh, any feedback about that, Jim? Um, I mean, for sure, I don't do politics, but my comment is some people are trying to say, this is a balance between being safe and economic recovery. It isn't actually that. You can have economic recovery and be safe. And, and so if, I don't think in, it is completely zero sum. We have a pandemic economy. How can we make the pandemic economy stronger? We will have a post-pandemic economy. How can we make that stronger? It's not just simply saying, oh, we're going back to free for all the way it was. There'll just be changes in the, way, uh, in the way we do things in the way it was. That's my opinion. That's fair. It's an and statement. It doesn't have to necessarily be one or the other. Another great question is, how do you both feel about the notion that uh, partnering with other organizations, companies, businesses, not-for-profits, um, how key that will be in a future economy state? Um, it seems contrary to how countries are moving. However, as an example, airlines and hotels will need each other even more than ever, don't you think? So I'll start with Alex and then we'll go to Jim again. Yeah, I, I think actually it's a, it's, it's a very, very, very smart question. Um, I do believe that the, the, what we call open innovation, the idea of partnering with more people um, and particularly having innovation coming out of smaller um, companies um, is a trend that we will, that we have seen already and we will see more and more. New ideas are not born by large companies However, large companies have other advantages. If you think about typically um, Coca-Cola, for example, um, they, have, they are the best in the world for distributing beverages. There's no question, and this is what they can leverage. They have not come up with any good innovation for I don't know how many decades now. Um, they tried, but they're not very successful. So they're buying new things from smaller um, companies. And I think this is an economy that we will increasingly see. We will have some um, oligopolies, monopolies in some areas that are fed by, by an economy of a small creative um, group of, or a large um, group of small um, creative companies. 
Jim, anything about partnering with others? Uh, the reason for sure is companies are economic beings. So if it makes economic sense, it will be done. Why will it happen more now than in the past? I think it's simply because change and there's change is opportunity. Why, why are we partnering with Bayless Medical? Well, because they've got medical licensing, they have medical experience. And why are they partnering with us? Because we all of a sudden moved at a speed to get this ventilator project and, and whatnot. So they, I mean, they're used to getting Health Canada approvals in two years and three years. And we sort of said, we're not waiting two years or three years. And, and so we needed each other. And so uh, we partnered and same thing with, uh, you know, ABS friction, which what, what do they have, to, you know, what do they have to do with what we're doing? Nothing except they had resource energy. And I mean, without it, without them, they would, we would not have pulled off the ventilator uh, project, but I think it's just change spurs more partnerships. And as far as countries go, uh, countries, the leadership often feels that their job is only to look after the people in their country. And it's very myopic. They tend to think that if our country is, uh, you know, that's all they're going to do and do it to the exclusion of everything else. I think it's unhealthy. And if you look at history, companies which have closed borders tend to decline over time. Companies that have uh, open sharing, it's just like diversity on teams. If you have a more diverse team, you do better than if you have a, a monoculture um, team. But I don't think you're going to get that through politicians anytime soon. Maybe I can, I can actually add to this. Uh, I yeah. think it's a very valid point in terms of the national perspective. Um, if we see at the, if, if we look at the mega trends and at the big topics we have been talking or thinking about, like climate change, climate change is not going to be solved by an increase uh, of borders, of, of reinstalling borders. If we want to do this, we will do this together or no one will achieve that. There's no other option. We can only do it together. Um, and I think, in so far, and that is true for this pandemic as well. If the coordination and if um, the collaboration between countries would have been stronger from the very beginning, we might have had much less of an impact. We might actually not have this pandemic. And so I, I would totally agree with Jim that we have to use the tools that we have and possibly digitalization and this increase in digitalization hopefully is also something that motivates governments to um, increase their investments in that, that actually um, coordinated responses could have been um, one of the key um, responses that could have prevented this crisis from happening in the first place. I do think there'll be a little bit of a deglobalization though, because that might uh, be the part of the problem we're finding in our supply chain is we're global. And so you can't make a freezer if you don't have a compressor. Oh, by the way, all the compressors come from China. And so it's, it's, uh, there will be a deglobalization, especially around anything that's perceived as medical or safety. Because, uh, and, the, and governments are going to say, no, we need to have a production of, of a ventilator or of certain medical equipment in the country for fear that other countries shut down exports of that, which will create an inefficiency. You're way better off to make 100,000 of something in one country and make 100,000 of something else and then trade 50,000 each way than make 50,000 in two different countries. That's a good point, Jim and uh, Felix as well. I think relationships regardless and networks are still going to be key and as we continue to come out of this, they just may look differently. Um, a great question about whether or not, um, and I'll start with Jim, uh, if we believe that in-person businesses like personal care, restaurants, uh, location space rentals are going to recover more slowly than let's say product-based companies. Any feedback about that? And anything I, to do, anything we can do about that? So I, I personally think that, that, that yes, they will come back slower. Even my, myself, I'm not a real conservative person, but I'm gonna think twice before I go out to dinner on a heartbeat. And I think that smaller restaurants might even go better than the big, uh, the big restaurant or the big busy bar is not going to be as successful as a small quaint bar. So I do think that it will change, but that the, all we have to recognize that's a shift. Therefore, if you are an event space renter, what else can you do rather than saying, no, all I am is an event space, uh, renter. And, uh, what, you know, can you do ventilator production in your event space? I'm just being, uh, using that as a bad example, but you get the idea. You may have to change who you are and the way you do things. And also increasing your, uh, your sanitation, which we see grocery stores. I mean, grocery stores have those plexiglass walls up now. Uh, I mean, that's here to stay. 
Are we going to go to a restaurant? We're going to have plexiglass uh, uh, walls around us. Maybe, maybe we are. Is that bad? Maybe it's not. Do, do we have a standard that the waiter, um, you know, puts Purell on their, their hands before they come to service and after? Yes, because I'm going to go to a restaurant that I see um, Purell dripping from the ceilings. <laughs> Felix? Yeah, consumer behavior is going to change, no question. I mean, I'm currently at a conference in San Diego. Really, I'm at home in Guelph. Um, but this conference is fantastic. It had fantastic keynotes. It's very similar to conferences we have otherwise. Um, but we can do it online. And interaction is great. So I'm surprised. So the question is, um, there is a value in, in, in in-person interactions. Um, but there are alternative means of making many things that we're doing happening. And I think this is the answer to it. If you, if you look for something new to do, then there is still a need for entertainment, but this will potentially be somewhat different um, than it used to be. And I think the question is how, and that is a very good question. And then you, if you can answer it, you have a great business idea. Um, and that is what you should pursue. And we are looking for these solutions now. Great, great comment, thank you. So with just a few minutes left, I'm gonna ask one uh, last question. Are there insights from past economic crises that indicate post-crisis response? Um, you know, does ex past experience tell us anything and is there anything we should be thinking about as we think about um, recovery? So my opinion is uh, we cannot totally take from the past because this downturn is not the same as the downturn of 2008. It's not the same as post 9-11 downturn. This is, has some similarities to 9-11. Post 9-11, all of a sudden, we went into an environment where we had higher security. And you went into some office high rises in Manhattan, you had to show ID and you had to take your shoes off at the airport. So we will see changes as a result um, of this. I am concerned that uh, although there could be pent up demand, there won't be pent up money and there will be a, still a feeling of uncertainty and pe many people have lost their jobs. Many companies will be severely um, hurt by, by this. Even good, well-run companies uh, can, can be losing money right now because um, the economic situation has changed. And so I do think it could be a, a longer road to recovery um, in this case. But again, we'll be fine. We, were, we had fine lives post 9-11, even though the fear was we'd never have a fine life after post 9-11. Good point, Jim. Felix? Yeah, I guess every crisis is slightly different. We had the Spanish flu. We know a little bit about what happened there, but we're in a different age now where um, we can digitalize. Many of the, thing, many of the jobs are digitalized. Um, you see, for example, in Germany that there are regions that have digitalized offices um, where 33%, so around a third of employees working, are working from home anyway. For them, it makes no difference. Two thirds are not. For them, it makes a huge difference. Other regions have a much higher um, amount of what you could call white collar workers that can work from home. Um, and there, the effects are very different. Um, so for them, for these regions, actually, um, the pandemic is less likely to keep on being a problem, but also um, they're much less affected by these results. So it is, I think, really about reorganizing um, what we're doing. Um, and, and we have to get, I think the, the earlier we realize we have to start thinking about this, um, the better. That's an excellent comment. And I know I'm personally very grateful for your expertise, uh, your feedback, your knowledge. Uh, I wanna thank both of you, uh, Felix and Jim, for your participation and everyone who tuned in uh, to listen in. Um, today's session was recorded and will be shared via email shortly with everyone. Thank you for engaging with us along the way um, and continue to do so. Uh, and I'd like to let everyone know to join us next week in our second installment of the series. Uh, Felix mentioned we will be speaking about Leadership with Purpose, featuring uh, former Lang School Dean Julia Christensen Hughes and uh, management consultant Chris Houston. So I look forward to that and having uh, continued conversations with experts. Have a great day, everybody.